much. Yeah, and you know, putting a little extra effort into finding the joyful and the beautiful. I've told y'all before that one of my spiritual disciplines is that I have a I have a planner, and you know, in in my planner I have my to do list, and the to do list is usually full of stressful things or things that might cause me to worry. And so what I've taken to doing is next to the the to-do list, I have a thankful list. And during the week, I will look for things to be thankful for, a a good conversation with one of my kids or something beautiful that I see outside or just a moment of encouragement that somebody uh, gives to me. And I will write those things down so that when I go and look at my to-do list and think about all the things I have to do, I also see all the reasons to be thankful for this week. It's a really, it's, it's exactly what Rich was saying. So be a little intentional about it. So one of the things that's going on this week is this is our last Sunday to sign up for life groups. We have a, a six-week uh, summer session where we continue to do church. Uh, we continue to gather together to disciple But some of our life groups are meeting via Zoom. Some of them are meeting outside. We do have uh, one that is meeting in homes, and they are going to be studying the book of Revelation. Uh, I would like to invite you to join my life group. I am going to be leading a Bible study via Zoom, 7 o'clock on Thursdays. And we are going to be walking through one of the deepest, most profound parts of the Bible, which is the Sermon on the Mount. And I know some of y'all are in my, um, or were in my uh, Sunday morning uh, class. I'd love to have any of you join. Right now, I've only got two people signed up, so I'm really hoping some more people sign up for my life group. And you can do that uh, simply by sending me an email, sending me a text. You can sign up um, via the the website, uh, which you can connect to through the app, the church app as well. So, Uh, sign up so that uh, even in the quarantine we can stay connected. All right, so let's get to the Bible. We have been walking through 1 Peter, and we are to chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. Listen now to the word of God. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessings. For the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, Keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. Amen. So there's one thing that makes life just more difficult in every way, and that one thing is conflict. I mean, life is already hard enough as it is. We've got the the quarantine, the virus, we've got the economic struggles, we've got people barely keeping um, their noses above the water when it comes to family finances. We've got other families that just recently have received difficult diagnoses or Um, have suffered really tragic losses. And in the midst of all of those stresses, if you pile on conflict, it becomes overwhelming, right? If your family is already struggling with one issue or another, and then you're fighting, right? Husband and wife are fighting, or brother and sister are fighting, or parent and child are fighting. or your, you know, your business is just barely getting by and then people in the office are fighting with each other. I mean, conflict is just so stressful and so debilitating. I was talking to somebody who was working through some conflict just this week, and he said, I haven't slept in three days. I mean, that's just what conflict does. It's just stressful. And in the midst of all of this stress and all of this conflict, Uh, Peter 
tells us to search for peace. Search for peace and work to maintain it. And I really love the verb there, search, because sometimes it looks like there is no peace anywhere around. We look at our society right now, not only do we have all these problems, but we're fighting over all these problems. Search for peace and work to maintain it. That's the call of the Christian, to be peacemakers, to search for it. But of course, once you start talking about peace, you have to really kind of figure out, well, what does peace look like? Because in the Bible, peace is not just the absence of conflict. The, one of the slogans or the hashtags of the, the protests is no justice, no peace. And that can be something that is really not a Christian idea, like, you know, you don't give me what I want, then I'm going to resort to violence. And that, of course, is not the way of Jesus. But at another level, the idea that where there is no justice, there is no peace is very much a biblical idea. Because the idea of peace goes back to the old Hebrew word for peace. And if you don't know any Hebrew at all, the chances are you know the Hebrew word for peace. Who knows what it is? It's shalom, right? You've heard that before. <clears throat> and shalom is more than just the absence of war. That shalom is the well-being of the total, the total well-being of the total person. It's physical well-being, emotional well-being, spiritual well-being, relational well-being. And so when we're called to work for peace, we're called to be peacemakers, we're looking to, to, to enhance the well-being of ourselves and the people around us. And if you think about what justice is in the Bible, justice is simply putting wrong things right. Well, then it becomes very obvious that if there is no, if things are wrong, then shalom is not present. And so it makes perfect sense to say if there is no justice, there is no peace. And Jesus gets to this. When Jesus, you know, there, we always say that we really wish that, you know, that the Bible would give us step-by-step -step instructions on in how to do things. But the fact of the matter is that when the Bible actually does give us step-by-step -step instructions, we don't follow them. Because the, the one place that Jesus gives us step-by-step -step instructions is on how to deal with conflict. And he does it in Matthew 18. And when he says how to deal with it, he doesn't say, well, just pretend like everything's fine. He says, you've got to get to what's wrong in order to get to a place of peace. What he says exactly is, if another believer sins against you, you go privately and you point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, You've, got, you've won that person back. So the idea is you've got to name the wrong. And you've got to agree together that it was wrong. And then once you agree that something wrong was done, then you can restore the relationship. That's hard to do. Right? I mean, you know, we, we've got the protests, and those are all about trying to name what's wrong. And, of course, everybody's fighting with that. But you don't have to go that widely to think about how this is difficult because if you've ever had a problem in a relationship and avoided dealing with the problem, you understand the concept, right? You ever thought to yourself, well, I don't want to bring it up because she'll just get mad, right? And we avoid naming what's wrong. Or... You, uh, you, you have a problem in your group, whether your group is your family, whether your group is your office, whether your group is your church, whatever the group is, and you look around and you're like, this thing is wrong, and, and nobody's talking about this. And I, I don't know why we're not talking about it, but I, I guess I won't either because I don't want to do those three magic words. I don't want to rock the boat. 
And so we just go along pretending and we think we're maintaining the peace. But we're not. Because we haven't named the wrong thing. And then what happens, right? What happens in your marriage if you don't deal with it? What happens in your relationships if you don't deal with it? What happens in your organizations if you don't deal with it? The resentment builds and builds and builds. And then finally, something breaks. Something snaps. Somebody's temper snaps. Sometimes the whole organization snaps. Sometimes the whole relationship snaps. And so, in order to search for peace, sometimes you have to do something that seems really counterintuitive. You have to raise the issue, and it looks like that you are disturbing the peace. And that takes courage. It takes faith. But it also takes some other things, because sometimes when you, 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 you bring it up, you, you bring it up in such a way that uh, it, it's, it's harsh, it's judgmental, it's condemning. And so Peter gives us some, some attitudes and some actions. When he talks about searching for peace, dealing with the wrong, he says in verses 8 and 9, finally, be of one mind sympathize with each other. In other words, try to feel what the other person is feeling. Try to put yourself in their shoes. Love each other as brothers and sisters, and maybe better than some brothers and sisters, right? Be tender-hearted. Keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you, which leaves out pretty much Facebook and Twitter. Instead, Pay them back with a blessing. Now, we could take any one of those things and we could kind of focus on it. But what I want to do is I want to focus on one that I've never focused on before. I've never heard a sermon on this and I've never preached on it. And that's the quality of being tenderhearted. If you want to search for peace, Peter says you've got to have the quality of a tender heart. And I thought to myself, what exactly is the Bible saying there? What exactly is meant? And so you do what you do when you're a pastor and you want to figure things out. You go to the original biblical language, which is the Greek. And you look at what's the Greek word there for tenderhearted. And it's this really, really wild word, splachnos. And I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing it correctly because they taught us how to read the language. They didn't teach us how to pronounce the language. And it's got way too many consonants in it. And it sounds like something you do when you sneeze. Yes, when you've got a cold, right? But we'll just say that I'm pronouncing it right, splachnos. And the, the, the most basic meaning of splachnos is your guts, your innards, your, your liver, your kidney, your spleen, your, your, your gut. And so what's he, saying? What, what's he saying there? Splachnos, your guts. You've got to, be, you've got to have tender guts. I mean, it's like, well, I mean, the, the, the ancient people were a lot like us, that they associated their emotions with their inmost parts, right? And we do that too. We don't talk about our liver or our spleen, but we talk about our heart as if our heart were the center of our emotional lives. And we talk about um, having our heart broken when we're emotionally devastated. Or we talk about having our heart moved when something affects us emotionally. Um, so, I mean, we, we kind of do that. And then also, we sometimes talk about our guts as if something deep emotional was going on in our intestines, right? We say, I, it felt wrong just in my gut. So we do a little bit of the same thing. And so, obviously, one of the things Peter is saying is there should be, when we're working through conflict, there should be a deep emotional feeling. And so and I thought to myself, well, okay, so we've got that far, but what exactly does, are we supposed to be feeling? And, and what you do when you're, <clears throat> when you're trying to figure this stuff out is then you go to all the other places in the New Testament where the Greek word splachnos is used, and you see how it's used in all those other situations, and you get a kind of a feel for what the word means. And the, the interesting thing is um, that the English words for splachnos, there, there are a bunch of different words that are used, which shows that really there's not a word-for-word -word translation of splachnos. 
<laughs> but you get patterns. And the, the first pattern that I saw when I looked at it is that splackness is a deep feeling of compassion that causes you to begin to act in a different way towards someone. For instance, in Mark chapter 6, it says that Jesus saw a huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had splachnos, compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, so he began teaching them many things. So Jesus is looking for a vacation, he's looking for a break, he gets off, he gets to the point where he's going to take his vacation, and there is the work waiting for him, right? But he sees them, and he's moved by just the sense that they just seem like lost sheep. And out of that deep feeling in his inward parts of compassion for them, he changes his plan, and he begins to go back to work, right, to teach them. Or in Mark 8, where Jesus says, I feel, and he, different English word used to translate it, but I feel splachnos for these people. They've been here with me for three days, and they have nothing left to eat. So this causes him to change his plan, and he feeds them. One of the miraculous feedings arises out of this. And then finally, from 1 John, we read, if someone has enough money to live well, and sees a brother or sister in need, but shows no splachnos. How can God's love be in that person? And by shows no splach, it's not saying just you have to have a feeling. It's saying that that feeling should produce an action. Uh, namely, that you're going to help the person it, it, with the financial need there. So, okay, so you can kind of get a feel for what Peter is saying when he talks about having compassion that might change, but what does that have to do with conflict? And I kept looking in the New Testament, and there are, there's a couple of parables that talk about conflict. And in these parables, the way that the people find peace, or don't find peace, is through this quality called splachnos. Now, uh, one of the parables is not as well known. Um, it's sometimes referred to as the parable of the wicked servant. And it significantly is found in Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus has been talking about working through conflict. And the, the parable, very simply, is that there is this servant, and he owes his king a bunch of money, and the king comes to collect the debts, and the servant can't pay. And so the king goes to do what uh, you did in the ancient world when somebody couldn't pay their debts. The only way to pay it was to sell themselves into slavery. So the king's going to sell him and his family into slavery, and the man begs for mercy. And the, Jesus says, then his master was filled with splachnos. But here it's not translated compassion or feeling sorry, it's translated as pity, but it also could sometimes is translated mercy for him, and he released him, and he forgave the debt. Now, if you know the rest of the parable, you know that this, this servant, who is forgiven, goes out and encounters somebody that owes him money, owes him a debt. And he says, you got to pay me now. And the other person begs for some splack nose, some mercy. And what happens? Do you remember what happens at that point? What, is, what, is, what does the wicked servant do? Not down with the mercy. That's right. He just grabs him by the throat and says, give me what I am owed. There's no compassion. There's no mercy. And then the, the king hears the story and revokes the forgiveness of the debt. And uh, Jesus is making a point that when we're in conflict and we feel that somebody has wronged us, they've incurred a debt. And when somebody wrongs you, there's really no way to pay back that debt, right? I mean, you can say you're sorry, but that doesn't really take back what happened. And Jesus is saying that the way forward 
has to include some mercy and some tenderness for a person who actually does acknowledge they've done something wrong and ask for forgiveness. The second parable in which splachnos is used is probably the best-known parable, maybe the best-known parable in the Bible, and that's the parable of the prodigal son. And I don't need to give you the full story of that. You know it already. You know, you've got three characters. You've got the father. You've got his two sons, an elder and a younger son. The younger son says, give me my share of the inheritance, uh, which is an insult to his father, and it hurts uh, the family economically. But the father gives the younger son his share of uh, the inheritance. The younger son goes to a far country, wastes all the money, Uh, then uh, falls on hard times, uh, realizes he's made a mistake, and he decides to go back and ask his father for forgiveness. And here's uh, what Jesus says in Luke chapter 15. He says, So the younger son, the younger brother, returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming and filled with splachnos. He ran to his son and embraced him and kissed him. That 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 tenderheartedness is a willingness when someone comes and says, I'm sorry, to forgive the debt, to restore the relationship. And of course, the rest of the story is about someone who refuses to do that, right? The older brother hears the commotion, hears the celebrating going on inside the house, Here's the singing and the dancing, finds out his brother, his ne'er-do-well brother, has come home. And this is what his older brother does. He does not feel black nose, he feels anger. He won't go in. And his father, no matter what his father does, at least as the story ends, he is still on the outside. And, you know, the... the The thing that Jesus wants to convey and the thing that Peter wants us to convey is that when we're searching for peace, there has to be an openness to the person that hurt us, that if they will come and say, I am sorry, that we feel the kind of compassion that we do for somebody that's hungry, the kind of compassion that we do that that some misfortune has fallen on the person. And often we don't want to do that because... When somebody wrongs us, what happens to our heart? Does our heart become more tender when somebody's wronged us? No, our hearts harden. I mean, sometimes we get so mad that we we don't ever want to make peace with that person. In fact, there have been times when somebody's wronged me that I not only didn't want them to make peace, I didn't want them to come and say they were sorry. Because then I'd have to actually forgive them. I would rather just stay mad. It felt good to be mad, at least in the short run. I think it eats you up like acid to stay mad for too long. But, you know, I, I've, I've dealt with, you know, because, you know, pastors have to be peacemakers, right? And you get two people that are crosswise with each other. And I've had times when I'd be like, hey, let's get together and let's talk about this the way Jesus says to do. And they're like, I don't want to have anything more to do with this other person. There's no splack nose. There's no feeling of compassion that this rift has happened. And Jesus says, you know what? Not having splack nose is really not very good, right? I mean... Neither one of those stories goes very well for the person who has no splack nose. Um, you know, that's the point of the, the, uh, the, the story of the wicked servant is don't be that guy. And Jesus says, look, if you're not willing to have some pity and to forgive, then he says, you can't really expect God to forgive you. In fact, he, he says it in, right after that, but even more clearly, he says it after he teaches the Lord's Prayer. And he says, if you refuse to forgive others, your Father, meaning God, will not forgive you your sins. And we think to ourselves, well, I thought forgiveness was unconditional. And there he is putting the condition on it. But think about it. If, if, if your anger, your, your grudge is like, 
something heavy you have to carry. Maybe it's like a suitcase. Maybe it's a bunch of suitcases. What Jesus is saying, you can't get through the door into the kingdom of God carrying all that stuff. In order to get through, you've got to put that stuff down. Well, well, why? Why should I have to? Well, because there are no grudges in heaven. I mean, you, you, you can't get to heaven and say, well, I'm not talking to that person. That's not heaven. That's hell. And God's simply not going to allow heaven to be turned into hell. We don't get to do that. So if we want to participate in forgiveness, we've got to participate in forgiveness. So that's one thing. But here's another reason to have a little splack nose for people. People that have hurt us, people that we disagree, maybe people that have hurt things that we care about. That's what God has for us. I mean, God is the king who forgives the big debt. I mean, th yeah, that's why in, in our service, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say debts rather than trespasses, because debt actually is the better translation. And it does, I mean, that, that idea that, that when we hurt somebody else, we incur a debt that, yeah, just words saying I'm sorry, it never feels like it's enough. And because you know what? It's not. It's not enough to say I'm sorry. It's not even enough not to do it anymore. The hurt's still the hurt. And that's where the mercy comes in. But that's what God has for us. When we sinned against him, he sent his son to pay the debt for us and die on a cross. Because the center and the heart of who he is is a feeling of compassion for those who are hurting and those who have hurt themselves and even hurt others. And that's what we are called. And if you want to make peace, if you want to be a peacemaker, if you want to make the world a better place, then yes, we've got to address the hurts. We've got to name them. But once they're named and forgiveness is asked, we give it. Be tenderhearted and search for peace. Amen.